You are listening to Living the Clover Life. Well, welcome back. April and Nathaniel are here again this week, and we are continuing our discussion on the way of the cross. Nathaniel, you want to start us with prayer? Absolutely. In the name of the Father, and Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, you sent your only Son to minister among us and to die for our sins so that we might have a way back to you. We ask that you would bless us during this time as we reflect on the individual sufferings of your Son in his passion and in the stations of the cross. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. So uh, this year at St. Malachi, we ordered a lot of uh, ways of the cross from Magnificat. So usually we get the normal Lenten reflections day by day, but they were out of print by the time we got around to ordering. And so as a result of that, we we decided, you know, wouldn't it be a beautiful thing to provide people with a, a beautifully illustrated uh, Stations of the Cross that isn't just something they'll use during Lent, but in Lent, of course, but then also beyond. So what we'd like to do today and, and next episode as well is to walk through the Stations of the Cross, reflect a little bit on the suffering uh, that Christ is enduring, and then also reflect on these beautiful, beautiful images, which are, are painted by Josef von Furich uh, and are in a church in Austria. We'll try to have a link in the uh, in the description of the episode that has uh, a place where you can go and view those images if you don't have one of those books. But if you haven't picked your uh, booklet up yet, we encourage you to do that if you're a member of St. Malachi. So, and if you're not a member of St. Malachi, like Nathaniel said, be sure to check the description of this podcast, and we will have a link so that you can follow along yes. at the Im- with the images. Absolutely. So let's go ahead and enter this. We're kind of going to try to prayerfully reflect on on these things together. Um, we're going to examine again both the the instance of the uh, the station, but then also the the image and what the artist uh, Yusuf von Führer has to say to us about um, about this, because the artist always brings something to light, always focuses or draws something into into to strong relief for us. So, the first station, Jesus condemned to death. We adore you, o Christ, and we praise you, because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. So as Jesus is condemned to death, he, of course, is unjustly condemned. Pilate is trying to make a political point. He is trying to save his career from uh, being accused of not taking care of someone who claims to be king in the face of Caesar. So he's not living up to his secular expectations, let alone any kind of religious obligation. And Christ, again, who is perfect, who is absolutely innocent, is condemned to die because of the the, the viciousness of a mob and the the apathy of, of the governor. And most images, including the image that we have here, has Christ uh, being led away in sorrow. Uh, but then also you have Pilate who is washing his hands and, and saying, you know, I'm washing my hands of this. I'm not responsible. May his blood be on your head. And the Jews respond, may it be on our, our head and the heads of our children. And, and then Jesus is taken away. Now, for me, the image draws some very interesting things into light. So in the background, you have these, these two figures that are holding bundles of sticks with axes in them. And in the, in the Latin and Roman world, those were called fasces. And they basically were an, a, a show that you had the power over life and death. You had what was called imperium. And imperium meant that you were responsible to make decisions having to do with justice and life and death within your community. So you bound together all the parts of society, but you also had that ax. And here we have a perfect example of uh, Pilate, the governor, not, again, living up to his civic duty and fulfilling his responsibility to execute justice because he's giving into the mob, right? He's giving into what's what's being asked of him rather than what is right. And then once again, to emphasize Christ's uh, perfection, we see in the colors that Jesus is wearing, and at least most often you will see Christ dressed in blue and in red, right? Blue and red uh, showing his divinity, being cloaked by his humanity, and those two colors kind of working in tandem to show you, oh yeah, this is Jesus. Not not every image has that coloration, but traditionally that is the classic way to represent Christ, is blue on the outside showing his humanity and red on the inside showing his divinity. I also think that it's worth pointing out the the little figure on the on the the, the arm of Pilate's chair. 
It's a little demon. It's a little a little monster there. And so Satan, in a hidden way, is kind of tricking and working through and 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 buying the affections of Pilate by tempting him with power. I'm drawn to the guard. There are two guards yeah. taking Jesus away, and one of them is looking at you. Yeah. He's looking at you. And I think that's a reminder of you did this. Mm. You mm. meaning me, right? Yeah. I yeah. did this. You did this, Nathaniel. Yeah. Pontius Pilate, Pontius Pilate might have ordered it to yeah. be done, but really it was our sin. Yeah. And I love the way that uh, Von Fier has put, his, he almost looks sad, like, like you're making me do this. Yeah. Kind of like that as, a, as kind of an accusatory uh, look in that. Interesting. Well, let's carry on. <clears throat> The second station, Jesus carries his cross. We adore you, Christ, and we praise you. Because by your holy cross, you have redeemed the world. So a cross, again, is a, is a sign of shame. You'd be paraded through the streets. And he, in these stations, he is beautifully clothed to represent who he is. But, you know, uh, when you were on the way of the cross, when you were carrying your cross, you would be naked. You would be crucified naked. You would be publicly paraded through the streets as essentially an animal of, of burden, a beast of burden who would carry things uh, away. Um, and, you know, there was, there was no, no, nothing nice about being paraded through the streets in that way. You were a subject of mockery. You even see like the one guard has a, a lanyard on Jesus' waist. So he's kind of leading him, guiding him by that, by that strap. Like you would an animal. Like you would an animal. Exactly. Down there on the bottom left, you see a, a man kind of picking up a hammer and, and cleaning things up. This cross seemingly was just made for this for this occasion, and it's just made ready just in time for Christ. Uh, the cross, of course, also represents the the tree in the Garden of Eden, right? That was the the source of our downfall, where we ate the, of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Uh, Christ is is once again erecting that tree uh, and, and taking it up. You also see, I think, in the background, the woman who is uh, a younger woman who seems sad and is being comforted by an older woman. That that may be Punctious Pilate's wife, because Punctious Pilate was, is said to have uh, been warned by his wife, "Have nothing to do with him. Like, don't don't do this. I had a I had a dream about this. This is a bad idea." Um, and yet he he kind of goes through with it. The third station, Jesus falls for the first time. We adore you, O Christ, and we praise you. Because by your holy cross, you have redeemed the world. So we have in this beautiful image and kind of in a reflection on the fall, as I mentioned in the last episode, in the three falls of Christ, we see him uh, falling, the first falling more and falling the most, like taking on the most sin in all three, in, in the three of his falls. However, if you look at the bottom of the image, Christ is kind of falling down into a bit of a, of a ravine, a ditch. There's a, an animal snarling at him which it wouldn't be normal for a, for an animal to do that. So there's, again, a representation of attack upon Christ and rejection of him kind of trying to bring him even lower. But he's looking down and he is he is weighed down. He's burdened, you can see, and there's a kind of a crack in the earth. So I don't know if the author intended this, but he's kind of approaching that that those lower parts. He's, he's entering into the, the lowest expression of his... Uh, divinity, whereas divinity is, is the most cloaked, right? He's embracing this suffering. Uh, I love the the Sadducee or the Pharisee on the on the on the right hand side that has his finger up, like saying, "Say now, now you'll you'll know what you deserve," and kind of accusing him. So, and Nathaniel, up in the there are two soldiers on horseback at the top, and one of them appears to have a face mm -hmm. on the sleeve of his shirt. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I think that that is is in reference to. Uh, again, the demonic, like controlling the the guards and kind of acting out mm. the uh, their Makes their sense. will on them. Um, you also again have something that's worth pointing out is that many of the people are dressed not as they would be dressed in the ancient world, but as they would be dressed in the medieval world, uh, more closer to the times when Josef von Furich would have been painting this. And that's something that, that's worth calling to mind is that this is something again that we mentioned before is is ever present to us. And there has to be uh, an understanding that our our engagement with the cross and with Christ's passion, uh, if you understand it through your own time, if you were to picture the, the passion of Christ happening with people running on in t-shirts and jeans, uh, that wouldn't be a bad thing, right? Uh, most of the artistic history of the church has had people do things like that as a way of making 
the, the Lord's passion more present to them at the time. That little basket with the, the bottle in it, I'm not sure, but I'm wondering if that is the kind of the, the bottle of vinegar that is used later on for uh, for Christ's sponge that's raised to his lips where he he refuses it. Um, but all in all, it's it's the beginning of uh, a very long, long uh, road with many falls along the way. Let's continue. The fourth station, Jesus meets his mother. We adore you, O Christ, and we praise you. Because by your holy cross, you have redeemed the world. Now, you can only imagine what it would be like for a mother to encounter her son who is condemned to die in the streets and how he is to how he is to, to continue to suffer, you know, what's she to do with that? Um, well, and as you can see, you know, she has her friends there consoling her. Mm, They're grieving mm, for the upcoming loss of her son, right. just as they would their own. Yeah, and when you have St. John there as well, you see that the guards kind of mocking, seemingly, her as as they're showing her the, the hammer and the nails, like, this is what's going to happen to your son. Um and again, in, in some way, this should be how we respond to Christ's suffering. We shouldn't be aloof from it, right? We shouldn't be uncaring. We should care intensely that Christ died for us. And then there's, the, again, the greater sorrow that we were the ones who have, who have carried it out by our sin. And, you know, Nathaniel, in this Magnificat booklet, um, there is a, a quote from St. Elizabeth of the Trinity yeah. on this particular station and the very first line is, this queen of virgins is also the queen of martyrs. Mm, yeah. And I just think that that is such a beautiful line and really sums up this particular painting yeah. perfectly. Yeah, well, and, and and I think that there's so much to be said for Christ being the perfect martyr, right? the perfect witness of God's love. All others are kind of types uh, uh, of his, and she's the one who, from the very beginning, had an understanding of what it was going to cost, right? Saint, uh, uh, Simon or Simeon says that a sword will pierce your heart. She's also there at the birth of John the Baptist, who is, of course, one who, who the first one to die um, in in proclaiming Christ uh, when Herod kills him. So she's absolutely the queen of martyrs. Christ's face there, I think, is uh, an interesting expression because he seems to be. Uh, very much awake, not kind of downtrodden, but very much attentive to his mother, like concerned for her as she is is suffering uh, for him. Uh, well, as, as you he mentioned, suffers. yeah, and I think that's because, as you mentioned in the last episode, Christ took on all of our earthly sufferings. Mm. So everything we've ever suffered and everything we've ever felt, Christ felt yeah. in that moment, especially when he was praying mm. in the Garden yeah. of Gethsemane. And so he knows what she's feeling because Absolutely. he felt that. Yeah, yeah, that's beautiful. And I, I'm sure I that that about. hurts him. Yeah, because he loves her so much. Yeah, that's that's amazing. Uh, the next station, fifth station, Simon of Cyrene helps Jesus to carry his cross. We adore you, o Christ, and we praise you because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. So Jesus is exhausted. And it's interesting that there isn't a, a fall right before this because it would make sense that, that he would fall and then they would say, oh, he can't carry it anymore and, and kind of press Simon the Cyrene, Cyrenian to, to assist. But he seemingly is just not going fast enough, right? He's not approaching uh, the Calvary quick enough. They need to get done with this. This You, you can kind of see in, in the fact that Simon the Cyrenian is helping that this is just all in a day's work for them. This is this is something that's done totally callously. This is commonplace. Like, okay, Come on, we, we got to get it done. Let, let's have somebody help him because he's not carrying it fast enough. So let's just let's just get this going. And that callousness, again, should help us to know or to realize we must not be callous when it comes to our sin and to the sufferings of Christ. We can't just say, oh, God's got this. You know, my, my, my sin, it, it's fine. Now, again, once our sin has been committed, we, of course, want to trust in the mercy of God. But before we commit sin and and as a way of preventing us from committing sin, we need to be very sensitive to the effect of our sin. Uh, once again, you have the mob kind of surrounding Jesus and trying to make him uh, go faster. And, and you see this, this humble man there in the image uh, being called from his work in the field to, to carry a cross, uh, a cross that he doesn't want to carry. And sometimes I think for us in our life, God is asking us to carry a cross, but we're like, but Jesus, I don't want to carry this cross. 
Um, and so uh, many times, many times, most times, most right? Times. So St. Simon Serenian, it can be a great um, gift to us in terms of his intercession for uh, carrying well the crosses uh, that Christ wants us to assist him in carrying. The sixth station, Veronica wipes the face of Jesus. We adore you, O Christ, we praise you. Because by your holy cross, you have redeemed the world. Now, St. Veronica, to me, is is one of those amazing saints who really, to me, I, I resonate a lot with her because she doesn't care what the mob thinks. She loves Jesus. And I think our world needs that in, in a way, in a radical way that, uh, that doesn't try to be hip or cool or with it, um, but just says, oh, Jesus is suffering, or, or I feel called to do this thing for Jesus. I am going to do it. Now, I, I say that she, I resonate with her because I want to be like her, right? I, I want to have that, that courage. And, you know, as a woman in the face of a mob of probably mostly men who are, you know, public executions were kind of entertainment. So you'd have drunk people kind of like jeering and like, like men at their worst. And you have this woman who approaches and comes through the crowd and takes the time with this white cloth, which we still have today, to wipe the face of Christ. In spite of every opposition and risk to herself, she courageously shows what kid me best about the church as, as the bride of Christ in, in some sense. I love this, this image in the book because you, you have this this older man kind of leaning down to her like hey uh, honey that's not a good idea like 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 he might even be benevolent to her but like oh don't don't do that you're going to get in trouble and she's like nope i don't care and she's just so intently looking at jesus it's so beautiful well and if you noticed behind jesus you know that tie around the waist that yeah. we talked about in the first image uh the the guard is tightening it. Yeah. Yeah. He's pulling like, no, we're not going to let this happen. And then you also have above him, the blessed mother still uh, kind of carrying on uh, the, the pursuit, the, the accompaniment of her son in his suffering. Uh, and so Veronica is in some ways a, a counterpart to Mary. Like let's notice how she's in the bottom left and, she, and Mary's in the top right. So she's not where Mary is in terms of, of height and closeness, but she is, she's approaching that and she's trying to convey that same sort of feminine care for the love that she has for Christ, um, which I just think is so beautiful. The, the artist sets up that, that, that not opposition, but this comparison between the two. Well, and we know that when Jesus does wipe his face with her cloth, his, the image of his face yeah. remains on the cloth. And right. I think that that's just a beautiful symbol of any time that we are willing to step out mm -hmm. and act in true love for Jesus that that's reflected, that image stays on our hearts. Right, right. People can see that image in us. Absolutely, absolutely. And again, I think we have that that cloth, Veronica's cloth is somewhere today. I don't remember what church it is in Europe, but it's, it's, it's very beautiful that still, like the Shroud of Turin, remains with us to today. The seventh station, Jesus falls the second time. We adore you, O Christ, and we praise you. Because by your holy cross, you have redeemed the world. So here we have Christ falling a second time. Of course, he's, he's exhausted by this time. He's, he's not able to maintain his stance. And, and who knows, like, is someone tripping him? Is, is it our sin that trips him? Is he, is he just exhausted? Does he lose his footing? Um, does he have something that just prevents him from being able to, to, to stand? Whatever it is, it represents, again, him drawing closer to the earth, closer to uh, uh, our sin further away from the joys of heaven. And when he is down, you might imagine he is hit, he is kicked, he is, he is beaten as an animal would be in trying to have him move on and to, to get this thing done because we, we want to be done with this. I think the image in this case says a lot about kind of the, uh, the frustration that the, his, his guards and those accompanying him have because you'll notice that there's a, a bludgeon in the hand of the guard who's grabbing his arm. So there's a dagger that he has as well. So this, he's about to do some violence on Jesus. These are not kind men. These are brutal men who do this on a regular basis. And then you have the, the kind of followers behind who are mocking him, raising their hands like, come on, what's going on here? I do think there's one figure, uh, a couple figures that are, that are interesting, however, and that is the, the central figure. In the image up to the top, there's, there's two um, figures there, I should say. 
you have a, a man and you have a young, what seems to be a young girl. And if you look closely, she's looking up to her father, trying to, to know what she should think of this. She's, she's trying to, to understand the situation. She's kind of looking up. Seemingly the father is kind of looking on, but not doing anything. Um, seems to care about the situation, but, but not really able to do anything. And so there can be this helplessness when, when we fall, right? So when we fall in sin, sometimes we feel a helplessness. We feel a, uh, an inability to, to, to rise up, to stand up. And when we're down, right, the, the devil loves to beat us. He loves to trick us into falling. And then he loves to accuse us and, and beat us with our sin. And there can be the, this helplessness. And you might think of the young girl as our soul, Right, our, our our soul kind of looking to 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 the to the whole of our person, saying, "Okay, you know, what are we going to do about this?" And then there's this uh, more older, frailer part of us that just doesn't sure what to do or or how to respond. It's a sadness, but maybe an inability to act on behalf of of our own uh, of our own good and response to Christ. I don't know. That's kind of what what jumps out to me in the image. But no, that's exactly what I was thinking. Is you know, how many times do we? see something or are in a situation and we think I I'm good enough. Mm. I did good enough. Mm. My actions were good enough. Yeah. But really are we witnessing the fall of Christ mm. Mm. and just being a bystander? Yeah. We maybe just not, maybe not wanting to draw attention to ourselves because they're also quite removed from the crowd. They're yep. not part of the crowd. Yep. So watching thinking, Oh gosh, that's terrible. Yeah. Or, you know, it's unjust, yeah. but not actually doing anything kind of hiding in the shadows. Yeah. And how often do we do that? I think that figure can also remind us of the times when there literally is nothing we can do, mm, right? Yeah. Um, you think of the, the death of a loved one or, or, or accompanying someone in their suffering. Maybe there is nothing you can do at a certain point and, and how to, how to live with that, how to, how to carry that. And just remembering that, that Christ already carried all of those falls, all of those sufferings. So as we, we continue to contemplate the, the stations of the cross, uh, we're going to continue with the next seven stations next time. But I hope this has been helpful to kind of draw out maybe some of the significance of the stations of the cross as you uh, start this Lent to consider and to reflect upon the meaning of what Christ has done for you. Until next time, keep living the Clover Life. You've been listening to Living the Clover Life. For more information about St. Malachi Catholic Parish, check out our website at stmalachy.org. S-T-M-A-L-A-C-H-Y.org.